Welcome to the Yogi MD podcast. It's Nadine, yoga teacher, health coach, and retired doctor, here to bring you and your body together, not in sickness, but in health. Thanks for taking this time for yourself. Just before her senior year in college, my daughter Maddie went to Kenya to participate in the Kubi Fora Field School. The program consisted of undergraduate and graduate students who were there to learn the basic principles and field methods of paleoanthropology on location at the most productive early hominid discovery region in the world, Kubifora. When she came back, she was full of excitement. And so today, she returns to the show, and I am excited to have her back to chronicle her incredible experience in Kenya. Welcome back to the podcast, Maddie. How are you today? I'm good. (laughs) Excited to be back. So Maddie, why did you go to Kenya this summer? So I wanted to go to Kenya because ever since I started doing research in labs, I really wanted to experience the fieldwork aspect of it. I was always doing the data analysis and everything was back in the U.S. removed from where the data came from. And so I really wanted to have the other side of actually going and collecting the original information. So then once I started taking courses in human evolutionary biology at school, um, and my interests really started to develop in that realm during my sophomore year, I decided that I just had to go and visit the places where the earliest humans lived and where our species originated. Uh, So for a little background, Africa is where we believe that our species, Homo sapiens, originated. So we all have common ancestry in Africa. Kenya and East Africa in general are significant because many of the earliest and most famous discoveries of our most ancient ancestors, which we call hominins, were made there. So last fall, I think it was, one of my advisors in the human evolutionary biology or HEB department at school sent me a link to the information about this program. It's run through George Washington University called the Kubi for a Field School because she, I was taking a class with her at the time and she knew that I was interested in doing some field work. So she said, this would be very cool for you. You should talk to this other postdoc at Harvard right now. She is affiliated with the program and has been on it several times. She would be a great resource for you. You should go have a chat with her. So I reached out to her via email, and I met with her a couple of times just to ask questions about the program, what it would involve, what it was actually like going out into the field. And after talking to her those couple times, I was basically convinced. And so it was about four days before the application was due when I decided I'm going to send in this application. So... That night, I wrote it up and uh, applied. A few weeks later, found out that I got into the program. So then this idea that I had had for such a long time that I really wanted to go and do field work was actually going to become a reality. That must have been really exciting to get that letter of approval. Definitely. What was it that excited you the most about wanting to learn beyond what you were reading on the page in the field? I think a big part of it for me is that when I'm reading, especially something that's sort of dense scientific literature, even when there are figures and pictures, you don't really get a sense of what it actually looks like. And in this sort of research, the context of where you find everything is super important. And the other thing is when you're studying fossils here, very much removed from the original material. Everything is a cast. It's often reconstructions. So you don't exactly get a sense of what the thing actually looked like when it came out of the ground. Uh, So I really wanted to be there and see original material, what it looks like, how things are eroding out from the hills, and, and understand how the process went from you were walking around and you found a fossil to deciding that it was a new species or something like that. Mm. So, How did you feel leading up to the journey, and how did those feelings evolve during your visit to Kenya? So it's interesting because I definitely, it didn't really feel real until, right up until I was going to leave. It was just like, 
I would tell people, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to Kenya this summer. But it was very sort of abstract. And I think that often happens to me just because I can't imagine what it's going to be like, especially with something so different from anything I've ever done. Leading up, as I was sort of preparing for the trip and getting all my things packed, it was nerve wracking from the point where I left home until I got to Kenya because of course traveling internationally is always left up to chance. You know, there's so many variables going on. Is my bag going to get there? Are my flights going to be on time? But everything went very smoothly on my way there, which was great. So once I got there and I was with a group of people from the field school, I was super excited for this new adventure and I was ready to go. Did it feel any different than before? Because as a family, we've traveled before. We have traveled internationally. So was this mm -hmm. any scarier or different? It wasn't so much the international part because we have traveled internationally before. I'm so used to flying at this point. It's just another thing that I do. But it was very different because I was going so much farther than we've ever gone. Mm -hmm. um, it was total of over 16 hours of just flying. So it took a little over 24 hours door to door to get there. So it was the longest trip I've ever made. There were a lot of connections. So it's just a little bit stressful, obviously, to go so far away by yourself. There were no other students on my flight. Yeah, but once I got there, it was totally fine. Did those feelings change over the seven weeks? I think over the seven weeks, I sort of retained that level of excitement the whole time because throughout the six weeks of field work in the program, it was very much there was something different going on every day to look forward to. And for me, so I went out on the paleoecology team, which basically meant that we went out doing survey every day. So we'd go out into a specific area. We'd all walk around looking at the ground the whole time for fossils. And oftentimes we would stop when we found an area that seemed to have a lot more fossils than you normally would see. So you would stop at those types of places and do what's called a bone walk, where Everyone stands in a line about arm distance apart from each other, and you all walk about 30 meters or so, counting everything that you see and recording what it is. And that was always interesting because you never knew what you were going to find. Throughout the whole survey process and doing bone walks, you could always stumble upon something super interesting or super weird. So I like that feeling of you go out and you have no idea what's going to happen that day. In Nairobi, it was cool because... I was back in a city, and there were a lot of different things to see. So I got to see the museum there and see all the different things in collections and sort of learn how you go from the field with all of this original data that you've collected, and then you go back and you actually figure out what it is. And so you get to go look at all of the existing collections that have been identified and take your stuff, compare it to the stuff that's already there, and then make judgments on, okay, this really looks like it belongs to this species, or, you know what, this is kind of messy. I don't think we can confidently identify this to anything, so we're just going to leave it as what we think, you know, the broader taxonomic category is. So it's a species of a pig instead of it's this specific species, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So clearly the excitement in your voice is evident. You clearly enjoyed what you were doing and you were connecting to the work that you'd be only been able to see in books. What was challenging about the trip? So definitely what was challenging in the beginning was sort of adjusting to not being at home. So you're in a very different environment from what you're used to being in the U.S., living in a city versus going to the middle of Kenya where it's you're in one of the most remote places in the world. You're very isolated from everything. There's no internet or anything, which, by the way, I kind of enjoyed the no internet thing. It was kind of nice to have a break from that. Mm, but I want to hear more about that in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> it was challenging to live in a tent 
um, not have your bed, you know, and these comforts of home that you're used to. Um, once we got up to the field sites, it was around 100 degrees Fahrenheit every day. So it was really, really hot <sighs> and sunny and dry. So you had to adjust to drinking a lot of water, making sure you're hydrated, putting on sunscreen all the time. It was just those things that sort of you have to adjust to in order to make sure that you're keeping yourself safe and healthy the whole time. Um, but once you sort of get a hang of that, it's you get used to it and you kind of get used to the flow of how things work in camp. What did you miss and what did you not miss? Well, obviously I missed friends and family and being able to talk to everyone at home. But I also really miss just variety of food from home. <laughs> A lot of times our conversations in the field would center around, oh, when I go home, I'm going to eat XYZ flavor of ice cream, you know, <laughs> get all these different things, go to these different restaurants. We had fantastic staff who made sure that we had fresh food to eat every day. They baked bread for us every morning. It was fantastic. But there are only so many things you can bring into the field. But what I didn't miss was access to the internet. I honestly was happy being very present there and being with the people I was surrounded with. And it was nice not to have to pay attention to my email because I get a ridiculous number of emails a day. So I didn't have to respond to anything. There was no distraction of Facebook, Instagram. So that was actually really nice to just be very disconnected from all that other stuff. I wasn't looking at my phone all the time. And I was very just in the moment with everyone, which was really nice. And it meant that I could do really good work there because I didn't have things distracting me all the time. Did that surprise you? Not really. I was really looking forward to not having to look at my phone and check my email. Hmm. Yeah. So since you've been back, have you found that you've assumed maybe a different approach to handling social media? Well, I think now is actually something I've started doing very recently is turning my phone on do not disturb and getting rid of just the notifications coming in all the time, especially because right now I'm working on writing my senior thesis. So I don't want to have to, I don't want to be bothered by these other things that are not important. I want to be able to sit down and when I'm going to work, I want to be able to focus. And I think getting used to sort of being disconnected in that way helps a lot because I know I don't need to be looking at Instagram every hour. You know, it's something that when I want to take a break, I'll sit down, scroll through for 20 minutes, whatever. But when I'm doing work, I don't want to see it. So. Hmm. What did you learn about yourself in Kenya? So I think one big thing that I learned about myself is that I'm willing to do anything for the sake of cool research, um, which taught me that this is the field that I want to be in. So I had never been camping before this, and then I decided that I wanted to sleep in a tent for six weeks. So um I realized that I will push myself to do new things because I really like this. Yeah. Do you think you've changed since you've been back? Besides the social media commentary you made and, and <laughs> thinking about learning how to focus and knowing what you need and what you don't need. I think one thing that I've noticed has changed a little bit is I never considered myself to be someone who likes to be outdoors. Um, I've always been sort of uh, like my favorite activity is not, you know, to go hiking or be outside, you know, but after this trip, I learned that I actually do enjoy that. Uh, being outside is really, it's just very calm and peaceful and it's beautiful. So we were surrounded by this gorgeous nature all the time. And so since being home, I appreciate that a lot more. So I think that's one way in which it changed quite a bit. So what were you thinking when we went on our trips to the Smoky Mountains so much that your father and I loved so much? <laughs> <laughs> I think part of that was I was a lot younger. So you kind of have to just learn how to appreciate that. Um, mm. And I think this taught me that. Did you have any more aha moments? Aha moments is not 
the right way to describe how I sort of came about these realizations just because everything that happens in the field and when you're abroad doing this kind of work, it's very fast paced and there's always something going on and you are, you're in an unfamiliar environment. So there's not really a lot of time to reflect on the experience while you're in it. But overall, I did have the sense that I was where I was supposed to be at that time, which was really cool. You mentioned earlier about really connecting with the people around you because you didn't have the internet. And you mentioned the word isolated before. Were you ever bored? No, definitely not. I was really lucky because we had such a great group of people there. So there were always people to talk to and hang out with. And I also brought books to read and there was work to be done. So at the end of the day, after you've been out in the field working in the sun and the heat, you're exhausted. So after dinner, after you've sort of spent a little time socializing, it's like 30 minutes and you're asleep. So there, there was never a time where I was thinking, oh, I wish, you know, I could watch TV or something like that. What kind of activities did you participate in together as a group when you weren't working? We went down to the lake a lot. So when we weren't working, it was we were given time to, you know, sort of do whatever we wanted. So a lot of times that centered around doing laundry, going to the lake, just hanging out. On the last day of actual work during the program, after we took our final exam, everyone went down to the lake. So we spent the whole afternoon there hanging out. We took a ton of pictures, you know, because we all needed to prove that we went, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so a lot of time spent at the water. And we all got to go earlier in the trip on uh, game drives where we stayed at this wildlife reserve during the first week. And we got to go around and observe all the animals around, which was so cool. We would always around dinner time, everyone would sort of sit around outside because everyone was done with work for the day. So there were a lot of fun conversations that would happen. Uh, we played cards a lot, different games that people came up with. And Oh, so it inspired some innovation. Well, no, not necessarily innovation in the field, just different things that people knew from childhood. So, for example, we, a bunch of us learned this game that um, a couple of the people at the field school from South Africa used to play when they were kids. Oh. So they taught us this hand game, which was actually really difficult to go around. So it's really hard to explain in the context of not actually doing it, but basically it goes around in a circle and everyone has to repeat certain words at certain times. As you go around, you're also clapping a beat out. And for some reason, it took us forever to figure it out. But that was really funny because we we're sitting around, we had nothing really else to do, but we had so much fun playing that. Yeah. Mm, that sounds like such a, a rich experience. I know you were very busy with your field work, but did you get a chance to interact with the people who were living there? Yes. For about two weeks when we were in the field up in northern Kenya, we stayed in a village called Illaret where the people there are called the Dawsonich. That's the ethnic group there. So we were able to interact with them and actually live in their village. So they're a pastoralist group of people, which means that they raise livestock as their primary means of food. And that's what their local economy is based off of for the most part. Although they are sort of integrated into the larger Kenyan economy now um, through the village of Illaret. There were a lot of goats and cattle and camels everywhere, which is really cool. The... People were very generous in allowing us to stay in their village. And so they would help us out sometimes by uh, giving us guidance around the field site. And so we actually had one man from the village, his name was Lawrence, who came out with us to our field sites for many of the days, primarily because the first couple days that we went out, 
a lot of the kids in the village found it super interesting what we were doing going around and they really wanted to help us out picking up fossils. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times that can be a little distracting when you're trying to do work. So, and because some of them do speak a little bit of English, which is really cool. So some of the kids would try to practice their English with us, but it was often hard to communicate. No, we really can't have... 30 people collecting fossils at the same time. Mm -hmm. We sort of need to keep it in a small group, Mm -hmm. keep things in the context where they are. So in order to facilitate that communication, we had Lawrence come out with us. We want to make sure we're always being respectful of their space. We're the ones who are guests of, of where they live. So Lawrence came out with us a lot and he was awesome because he's so nice and he was actually really interested in the work we were doing too. So he would help us look for good places that seemed to be extremely full of fossils. And in fact, he found this one spot. It was a ridiculous amount of fossils there. So we actually spent several days going back to that site and sort of characterizing what it was like. And so after the first day or two, we started calling it Lawrence Hill because it was this (laughs) hill where he found all these fossils and we needed a good way to refer to it. So that was really cool, and it was nice to be able to include the local people in our work in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was really cool. And then the last day that we were in Illoret, many of the people came out, and they had sort of a market out for us where we could buy things from them, trade. So I was able to buy souvenirs, things that you could never get anywhere else. So I got some really cool jewelry there, um, lots of wooden things that they make. Yes, we're all very happy with our souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> you could you could see through all of the different things that we bought. So, for example, I bought this. It sort of looks like a gourd, but it's made out of wood. So they, it's a lot of expertise that goes into making these things. They use it to milk their goats and cattle. And since it's made out of wood and it's not pre-made in that gourd sort of shape, you have to know how to make that and it's really interesting to see the cultural knowledge that goes into making such a beautiful thing out of such simple materials that you wouldn't intuitively think could be used to make something like that so it was really interesting to see that that's my gourd right yes yes it's proudly being displayed in my kitchen it's it's just a gorgeous handcrafted unique piece of art and and i just love it you nailed it Share with the audience what you told me about the goat, where the goat was slaughtered for dinner. It was definitely the most (laughs) farm-to-table experience that I've ever had, because literally that day, they brought two goats into camp, and the goat was there that morning, and then later in the day, the goat was being butchered It was interesting seeing it happen the first time because most people, especially from Western countries, have never been that close to where their food comes from, especially Mm -hmm. meat. It was all very humanely done. It's sort of uncomfortable to watch, obviously, but I think having seen the whole process of this animal being slaughtered for us was a humbling experience because you're actually very connected to this living thing that is providing food for you. Um, So that was something I think was very important to see. Um, It didn't turn me vegetarian, but um, it made me more grateful for it wasn't something that came from something very industrial and it was real. And this is how people have been eating for a very long time. A picture is worth a thousand words, yes, but being there is so much more than what we could appreciate. Please describe to your best ability what the landscape was like. That's a hard question. It was very different. There was a lot of variation because we started out in Nairobi, which is super urban. It's a very modern city versus We drove, I think, a total of four days it took us to get all the way up to where we were doing our field work. 
And you can see the environment change because you're going up in elevation when you first start. And it's extremely green, very lush, lots of tall trees. That's where you would see big animals like elephants, giraffes. Um, you see hippos in the river. So it's super diverse, lots of animals. But then when you're driving further north, you're going down in elevation. It gets hotter, drier. So it becomes sort of like a desert. There are a lot of beautiful rock formations that you see. Um, and everything is sort of that sandy color because the sun is so strong. You're at the equator. Yeah, up there you see the vegetation change. So it's not very green. You have lots of thorny things because it's a desert sort of environment. The animals are different. So you don't have big animals like elephants but you have a lot of smaller things like jackals desert hares lots of different birds the lake was beautiful because on the side that we were on we could see the mountains on the other side so every night at sunset since the mountains are on the west side you'd see the sun going down behind the mountains so it was beautiful and you could see so far because you're in such a remote place there aren't buildings or anything blocking your view and because it's so dry and um, very much a desert environment you can see for miles because there aren't a lot of trees. In our cities we're defining green space we're making efforts to make sure we have patches of grass and trees so I just wonder having never experienced what you experienced what it's like to actually see nature in its relatively pristine, conserved, majestic form. Yeah, it was really amazing, especially when we were at the wildlife reserve that we stayed at at the beginning, because only having seen those types of animals in a zoo context, it was so different to see them out living as they're meant to, you know, they're not confined um, you see elephants living in these big groups as a family, you know, so you've got the older ones and the babies all together. Mm. Um, for me, it helped to sort of deepen my respect for these animals and for having them live in this unadulterated environment and enforcing protections for them and things like that. Mm. What did your experience teach you about what's important to you? Well, sort of, as I said before, one of the big things is I have to enjoy the people that I'm around. I think a lot of what made the experience really great was that I was surrounded by so many great researchers and people in general. So that is super important to me in the context that I'm working in. So I was really grateful for that. And that's definitely something I'm going to look for going forward is do I like the rest of the people here? And if Yes, then fantastic. That's where I want to be. I learned to appreciate everything at home a lot more. So after living so minimally for so long, you definitely understand how much you really have at home and how privileged you are, really. Um, so one example is I definitely came back home less of a picky eater because we didn't have so much variety in camp, as I said before, once we left the field. Any source of something interesting was, I'll eat that. I don't mm. care. <laughs> mm -hmm. Definitely has made me more aware of, you know, how much food waste happens um, in the U.S. And I've definitely become more cognizant of that, even more so than I was before. So, yeah, mm. I think that's important as well. How are you applying lessons that you've learned from your experience going forward? One big thing that I've learned is that it's super important to push yourself to go after the things that you really want. Going outside of your comfort zone is so important. And so I think that's something that I'm going to continue to try to do more, as well as just being flexible. You know, the one of the mottos of the field school is patience, flexibility, and don't panic. And we all kind of joked about it because it was kind of like a silly motto, but it's really actually very important and practical in life in general things don't always go the way they're planned and you have to be able to work around that and 
especially as a scientist, you know, understanding that you're going to be wrong. You're not going to find the things you expect to find. So how do you adapt to things that you don't expect and how do you make it work for you and for how does it inform the future questions that you ask? I think that's super important to always be thinking about. You were on the podcast before and you gave us a definition of what it means to be healthy. What's your definition now? Now I would add that being healthy involves a sense of adventure and a sense of the importance of taking risks and doing things that you enjoy for the sake of the enjoyment and being comfortable with the unfamiliar and knowing that you're going to learn so much from it. I'm so proud. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. How exciting. And if my listeners were to go back and listen to your first episode, because I did recently, and compare it, everyone can definitely appreciate the growth. Thank you. (laughs) And now it's time for practical tips. I'm going to leave you with the motto that Maddie told us about in this episode. Patience, flexibility, and don't panic. Thanks for being here. See you next time.